they had one called Gangster Capitalism, and I asked them if they'd do a promo for me on their show, if I'd do a promo for them on my show, and they agreed. They did, and I recorded a little promo, put it on Gangster Capitalism, and I got a I got a pretty good run-up. Well, welcome, all you guys, back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I have a show today that we're going to deal with official corruption a little bit. And, and the reason I'm doing this show is I want to give a little plug for some people, another podcast company that I owe a favor to for that. And so I am returning the favor now. They have a new podcast just coming out called The Set. I would suit up in my uniform and you're going out on patrol. What are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to rob some drug dealers. And uh, I know how to do it really well. Listen to and follow The Set, an Odyssey Originals documentary podcast series, available wherever you get your shows. I'm not a bad guy, man, but I loved being that dirty motherfucker. Uh, that's S-E-T, and it's about the what was became known at the time as the Dirty 30, which is a precinct in Manhattan, and there was all this crack money flowing around, and during the 90s, and and there's people that took money. So and it became quite a uh, an investigation publicly, and these guys are taking a di- deep dive into it. They've got some of the uh, former cops and, and criminals that have given them interviews. So that will be an interesting podcast, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes. So that's my promo for the set, and Michael Vecchione is my guest here, and he's been on before. If you remember the uh, Luigi the Zip, the uh, Sicilian hitman, well, this is Michael Vecchione, the man that interviewed Luigi the Zip and, and came up with a lot of really interesting insights into the Sicilian Mafia and the Sicilian Mafia in New York City and, and kind of how that works. And, and I know a lot of you will really like that show. So welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for having me back, Ari. I appreciate the time. So, Michael, as as you just heard me say, and what I want to we've talked about a little bit about this before was about kind of this official corruption that goes on in big cities. And and you wrote a couple of books about that. One's called Friends of the Family. It's about the two mafia cops, uh, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa. And you have another one called Crooked Brooklyn. And, you know, my own experience is, especially during the crack wars, there was so much money out there. You know, I'm, I even had a drug dealer ask me, he said, hey, Sarge, you ever seen a whole room full of money? And of course, the the under underlying that was I've got a room yeah. full of money and and do you want some of that room full of money? Exactly. I just said exactly. no, man. No, that's okay. I'm cool. <laughs> he just laughed yeah. and went on. You know, we ended up putting him in jail and put his brother in jail. So you know, but it was out there and it's always out there. And Michael's been on the front lines of fighting that official corruption, whether it be in prosecute. I mean, everybody, prosecution office, uh, cops, uh, everybody. It's judges a, judges is susceptible judges. to this when there's that much yeah. money out there so michael you know let's start talking about that in in new york you you've been on the front lines of it your oh your second book was uh crooked brooklyn and which was strictly about that where you were a uh, prosecutor in brooklyn correct right so right let's well, start talking about that okay well you know if we start with the with the mafia cops case um the mafia cops case came to me about 10 years after they had both retired. Um, but I have to say that during the time those in, in those 10 years, I had also been um, the head of the police, um, the, the head of the prosecution arm of the police department for a couple of years. Uh, it was called the department advocate, and I was the chief prosecutor. And what we did was we were the internal um, uh, internal prosecutors for the police department, and we prosecuted police officers for violations, and not only police officers, people who work for the police department for violations of their, you know, the law, uh, the rules and pr- procedures of the police department. And sometimes you had to you, you came upon an investigation which actually was a criminal investigation, and it would be passed on to the to the district attorneys. That's where I first learned about Louis Epolito. I had heard about him when I was there. And um, and it was a kind of in the vein of being frustrated. The people who were looking to investigate him were frustrated. They all felt at some point or another that he was not the cleanest cop in the world. And, um, and then after he wrote a book called Mafia Cop, in which he talked about how his family were all mafia members and that he's held himself up to be the only, you know, the only clean cop or the only clean person in his family, 
it it really got the ire of um, a lot of the uh, the the police department brass. Um, but quite frankly, there wasn't much of an investigation. There wasn't much going on until we got the case, which was about ten years later. And when I say we, I'm talking about uh, my my good friend Tommy Dades, who was a detective in the intelligence division at the police department, came to me one day and he said, uh, "Walk just walked into my office and said, um, hey." I got some new information. You interested in, in looking at Caracapa and Epolito? Now, I also knew about Caracapa from the same sources. And I said, yeah, why? What do you have? He says, I think I got something that's gonna, that can crack this thing open. And he tells me about a woman who's, whose son was actually killed um, by Gaspipe Casso, who was the Lucchese underboss consigliere who had the mafia cops on the Lucchese payroll. And it all began with uh, Luke, uh, with uh, gas pipe, a st- unsuccessful hit on gas pipe by the uh, by John Gotti and, and, the, and the Gambino family. And the reason for that was gas pipe was part and parcel of a an attempted assassination on Gotti earlier. And he missed, he missed, but Gotti knew who was behind it and set out to, to get gas pipe. And he, he hired four guys who followed gas pipe around, got to a particular location in Brooklyn, a corner, while they both stopped at a, at a traffic light. And they opened fire on gas pipe in the car next to them and missed again. He was injured but not killed. And he set out at that point to find out who was in that car and who those four assassins or attempted assassins were. And what did he have? He had what he called his crystal ball. And his crystal ball was Epolito and Caracapa. They were on his payroll because they had been they had been recruited by an old Lucchese guy whose name was um, Kaplan. And Kaplan had uh, had known the uh, had known Epolito, had known Caracapa when they were working, and I say working for and working for the for the Gambino family. But <laughs> the Gambino family did something to a relative of Epolito's. He got pissed off. And they didn't start working for them. Did they stopped working for them? And Kaplan heard about this, and he was he knew that uh, that somebody like Gaspipe could use them and recruited them. And it was, he was the intermediary. They never met Gaspipe. Gaspipe never met them. But Gaspipe knew that if he paid Kaplan and Kaplan paid them, they would do what he was looking to do. So what he wanted was to find out who was in that car so he could take care of them. He found out that one of them was a was a guy named Jimmy Heidel. And Heidel was a local thug, you know, local hanger on, half a wise guy, as they say, not a made guy, who was one of the people in that car. And the and the mafia cops found out that it uh, that it was him, and he was one of the people. And they told Gaspipe, and Gaspipe said, "Bring him to me." So they go to Staten Island, where Heidel lives, and they knock on his mother's door. He lived with his mother. She doesn't know who they are. She has no idea who they are, and 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 they're looking for. Her. They're looking for this his son, their, her son. She says, Jimmy's not around. Jimmy's not. They leave and they stop a guy on the street who they think is Jimmy Heidel. It turns out it's his brother, Frankie. And they hassle him. And Frankie tells him, Jimmy's not here. I, and I'm not Jimmy. And Jimmy's not here. He's over in Brooklyn. And he tells him where they could where where they are, because they give him some bullshit story that there are two cops looking to. Um, he's been wanted. He's, he's a witness in a particular case, etc. And he doesn't think anything of it. Um, so they go to Brooklyn and they find out that he's in some social club or I think it might have actually been a bowling alley, to tell you the truth. And they sit outside and they wait and they see him and they they give him a line. They tell him that, you know, that he's wanted. They want to talk to him and they put him in a car, police car, which was basically a dummy car. It was not an actual. It looked like it was a Crown Victoria at that time. Yeah. And the cops were using Crown Victorias. But this was not an official car. It was one that they had that they used to pull this kind of ruse on people. They drive him to a particular location and stop. They say to him, okay, get out of the car. And he thinks that he's going into a police station. Instead, what they do is they put him in, they tie him up, they put him in a trunk of the car. And they drive him now to the uh, parking lot of a big kind of box store called Toys R Us. I don't know if how... If your if your your listeners or viewers know knew that, but it's sort of like uh, the Costco of toys at the yeah. time, and it was yeah. a big, huge toy store. And they drive them there, and what happens is Gas Pipe sends a couple of guys to the to the parking lot. They come into the parking lot, and they put 
uh, Heidel into the trunk of, of the gas pipe team's car, and they drive away. Now, they get paid for that. And as it turns out, when they – and I'll give you a fast forward a little bit. They, they bring him to this, this home in Brooklyn owned by a, by a, um, by a guy who is a, was a, a member of the, of the Lucchese family. And they bring him to the basement, and gas pipe tortures him. Tortures him. He gets who else is the names of who else was in that car, and then they take care of him and they kill him. And I find out later on from Gas Pipe himself where the body wound up. That story is the background to how the mafia cops came to me. And that is Mrs. Heidel picks up the phone one day and calls Tommy Dates. And why does she do it? Because she got to know Tommy because her other son, Frankie, was murdered. And Tommy was the detective who was assigned to that murder. She got to know him. She knew Tommy was a good guy. And she finally, finally came forward with this information, which she had been holding for years. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was she found out who the two guys were who knocked on her door looking for her son, Jimmy, because she was watching television one morning. And it was a talk show on called uh, the Sally Jesse Raphael show. Mm -hmm. And who was his her main guest that day? Louis Eppolito. He was <laughs> pitching his book, Mafia Cop. And she went out and bought the book. And she opened it up. And in the middle of the book is a photograph of Louis and Steve Caracappa together. And she said, man, now I know who this is. And listen, I, I'm out, hopefully this won't surprise you. It did surprise me a little bit. She went to the FBI first. They didn't have they had no interest in, in this. She went to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They had no interest in it. So she held on to it. Finally, it got really too much for her. She called Tommy and said, listen, I never told you this. And she tells him this story. And Tommy comes to me and he says, do you want to start this investigation? And I said, yeah, why not? Let's go do it. Where are the files? Now, keep in mind, Gary, 10 years old. Yeah. So I sent Tommy over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. He went. He was, he was shown into a room that had about 10 or 15 boxes of files on the mafia cops and other things. And they were all dusty. He put them in his car, drove them to the DA's office, and we set them up in an office um, right above mine, uh, on the floor above mine, and he began looking through this. One day, he comes in one morning, and he's happy as, he's happy as hell. He says, Mike, Mike, you're not going to believe. We, we got him. We got him. What did he find? He found a computer printout that had been um, that had been the had been, uh, I guess, created by Steve Caracappa. And what was it? It was the name of another guy who was in that car that did the gas pipe hit, and his name was Nicky Guido. And you could see from the computer printout that Louis, I mean, that Steve Caracappa came up with this Nicky Guido. They didn't know his exact age, but they estimated the age. He lived in Brooklyn in the area where they thought Nicky Guido would live. And he sells the information. He gets paid for this, of course, and he gives it to Gas Pipe. Now, why is that significant? Because there's an open homicide in Brooklyn, and the deceased is a guy named Nicky Guido. Yeah, this is the and one Tommy where they got the wrong. Me, is this the one where they, they got, got the, the wrong, wrong Nicky Guido? They got the wrong guy. They got the wrong <laughs> Nicky Guido. <laughs> So, so that, that really began the investigation. And, and what we found was what my boss at the time of the arrest called the most, the, the biggest corruption scandal in the history of the New York City Police Department. Paracap and Eppolito were on the mob payroll for information. And then they had a little side deal. And the side deal was if Gas Pipe wanted someone hit, he paid them extra to do the hit. And they do they do at least one hit, which also helps us in terms of getting these guys and, and ultimately leading to the conviction that, that happens, is they pull a guy over on the side of, uh, of one of the big highways in Brooklyn who they believe is the one of the, the third of the four people in that car. I'm sorry, they, he is one of them. But they when they pull him over, they ask him if he, and they give him his cousin's name. And he says, no, 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 I, I, I'm, that's not, that's my cousin. That's who you want. And they say something to him like, what, what's that on the floor of the car? And as he leans over to look down, Tara Kappa shoots him and kills him. Tara Kappa drops his watch at the scene and it's recovered. 
and it's put into into one of these box into you know into the file is put into one of these boxes. So we have compiled all of this evidence now, but there's a hole, and the hole is. We need someone on the inside. If we're going to put two detectives away, we need someone on the inside. And I go and make a call to Gas Pipe Casso's attorney. And why do I do that? Because Casso is in Brooklyn, believe it or not, in federal jail, getting ready to testify as a witness in a case uh, in which the U.S. attorney is prosecuting one of his one of his cronies. And um, and I call the U.S. attorney and ask them if they would give me permission because you need permission to go into the federal yeah. facility to take the guy out. And after a lot of back and forth, they didn't want to, didn't want me to do it. They were not very cooperative, the U S attorney. And I find out later on why I, they finally say, okay, you know, you can go talk to him. If he'll talk to you, it's fine. I call his lawyer, tell him what I want. His lawyer tells me I'll speak to gas pipe. He gets back to me in a few days and he says, no good. We're not doing it. I said, why? He said, because I want you to give him I want I want you to give him uh, immunity for that murder. He says, OK, but I want federal immunity as well. And here's where the problem comes. Federal authorities won't give it to him, won't give me won't give me immunity. And I don't know why. And they thought that by giving gas pipe any play at all and making him the key to a case against two detectives would give him credence. And that would would that would would then jeopardize their case against Gotti. So it didn't go anywhere, and um, and we were kind of behind uh, the eight ball. Now I got to tell you this: that the corruption was so bad with these two guys that when I finally looked at gas pipes three hundred twos, which are the police, which the the FBI uh, uh, investigative uh, forms and files, they had he had chapter and verse as to who. They were involved in killing who they who which information they were involved in turning over to gas pipe so he could kill Gary. It was um, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And it was so eye opening that even the feds, after all of the years that they refused to prosecute, because they had all this information, they then took our stuff and essentially stole the case from us <laughs> because I was going to prosecute this. They took it. They sold me a bill of goods that we would get all we would get the we would get credit and we could have an assistant DA be part of the team. And then what did they do? They just went ahead and made the arrest without having us involved in terms of of notifying us. And and they wound up trying the case in federal court. They convicted them and the judge set it aside at that point. Why? Because they charged them under Rico, and the judge felt that the Rico was weak and it was not. So I was getting the case back. In fact, I got it back <laughs> to prepare it for trial. And then ultimately it went up to the appellate court and the appellate court reversed the lower court and they went to jail and they both died in jail. Yeah. But it was um, it was something that, quite frankly, I would ne- I'll never forget because you, you could not believe the amount of, um, of, of corruption that was involved and what they were getting. They were on the payroll for a retainer. I think it was about $4,000 a month. <laughs> And then if they did a hit, that was another, you know, whatever it was, 10, 15, 20,000 that they were getting. And they were more than happy to uh, to do it. And they were doing this for years, Gary, years. And then they retired. They retired, <laughs> went to Las Vegas and began drug dealing in Vegas, which is how they ultimately, the feds ultimately cobbled together a RICO because of the continued drug activity in 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 Vegas, and um, and, and what they didn't understand, and what they really weren't smart enough to figure out, is that one of the people who they were working with, as they suppo- as a supposedly uh, go between between the drugs that they were selling and the people who wanted the drugs, turned out to be a DEA informant, and that kind of led them to led us to uh, led the feds to to the to the case that they had, and and it was it was remarkable, remarkable. I, I don't think. You know, I did a lot of cases as the department advocate, which were corruption cases. I've done corruption cases after that. But in terms of pure, uh, unadulterated corruption, in, in terms of killing, actually killing people, not looking the other way when someone, you know, is selling drugs uh, or looking the other way when, uh, you know, when one of your partners fills up his the back of his car with, uh, you know, with 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 goods, insert, with goods, you know, that uh, from from a guy who who they put the the strong arm on. It wasn't that I mean, they were actually killing people as a result of 
of getting money for um, you know from the from the mob. So so that was a that was a, a very very eye opening case, and and it you know it kind of was the beginning of what turned out to be a six or seven year corruption investigation from that I did with the rackets division of my my operation, which led to crooked Brooklyn. And that was an entirely different type of corruption because while I had the mafia cops during that period of time, the center of that case was judicial corruption and the corruption that that a judge, and I'll give you how we started it off, and it's an interesting situation. I get a call one afternoon on a Sunday. I'm watching a football game Sunday at home, and I get a call from the DA. And he says to me, um, be in the office tomorrow at a certain time. A lawyer who I happen to know, who was my former boss in my, in my early days in the DA's office, has a client who needs to talk to you. He's got a judge. who's He's got a crooked judge in Brooklyn. I said, okay. So I meet him. But I don't meet him at the office because we didn't want to have this lawyer and, a, and an attorney who was who was kind of well known in Brooklyn showing up at the DA's office because it was although Brooklyn's a big place, the legal community is a very small, tight community. And and the DA's office is right in the smack in the middle of the legal community. Someone seeing this guy walk into the DA's office could have raised some issues and we needed to keep this under wraps as best we could. So one of my detectives rented a, a a little small ballroom in a hotel, which the DA's office uh, shared a building with. And um, so it was not very unusual for this guy to to walk into the hotel. There was a restaurant in the hotel with his lawyer, et cetera. And, and he went directly to this room. And and what we did was we also created a, a sign that said like, uh, you know, I'm just making this up, like Georgia Enterprises meeting or something of that nature, because we didn't want people to get nosy and find see what was going on. And I walk in and I sit down with this lawyer and his client, and he tells me that he is a um, he's a civil attorney who has a client who um, was injured in a very severe automobile accident, and not only was she injured, but her infant daughter. And when I say infant, I mean the legal term infant, not a literally someone in swaddling clothes, but a, a young, young kid. I think she was like two years old. Sitting in the back seat, in the car seat, in the back of the car, injured very, very severely. And um, he brings the lawsuit and he gets in front of uh, and, and he and the other side settle the lawsuit for millions of dollars. Now, in New York. In order to settle a lawsuit involving an infant, the judge has to be careful and make sure that the money that is going to the infant actually is earmarked for the infant. In other words, there has to be there have to be bank accounts set up for the infant and only the infant to be able to have access to or the guardian. You can't uh, so that the parents, unscrupulous parents, don't scoop up the money and spend it before the kid is even eighteen years old. So it's very, very important that the judge sign off. In fact, it's essential in order to settle a case involving an infant in New York. So the judge in this case agrees. Okay, you know the inf the settlement is great, several millions of several million dollars, mm -hmm. and um, the lawyer prepares the what's called an infant compromise, which is the settlement papers for the judge to sign, and he gives them to the judge. And days and weeks and months pass, no signature. So one day he gets a call, the lawyer, and it's the judge. And he says, come to my chambers. Let's take a walk. So they leave the, they leave the courthouse, take a walk. And the judge says to him, essentially, <laughs> you are making a third of millions. Yeah. The kid is making a lot of money. You need me to sign the papers. <laughs> so I got to get a taste. I want two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Otherwise, I don't sign the the paperwork. So the lawyer says, he said to me when he, when we sit there, I said, "So what'd you say?" I said, "He said, Mike, uh, what can I say?" I said, "Okay." Yeah. So he prepares the papers. Papers get in. The judge signs off, and um, the lawyer sits back and doesn't pay. Now this is in the summer, Gary, when yeah. this is all taking place, right? 
Um, the lawyer tells me that summer passes, fall passes, Christmas holidays pass. He doesn't hear anything and he thinks everything is cool. Maybe the judge maybe heard wrong. He was trying to figure out how he could be approached by some judge looking for $250,000. And I mean, just a blatant act of corruption. Maybe he said, maybe I got it wrong until two days after New Year's, the New Year's holiday, when everyone's back to work, his phone rings in his office. It's the judge. Come to my chambers. He walks in. Judge locks the door behind him walks up to him and now begins to whisper in his ear. Essentially, I haven't forgotten. Where's my money? So the guy said, the lawyer says to him, okay, um, but can we, you know, can we, can we talk about the amount? And um, the judge says, okay. So he, he, he kind of uh, bargains him down to, uh, I don't know how he got this figure, but $115,000. <laughs> Don't ask me why, what that magic number was, but the judge agreed. So now he doesn't know what to do. He leaves the chambers. He goes to talk to this lawyer. The lawyer brings him to another judge friend to see. And the judge friend says, you must have heard this all wrong. This is all, you're, you're full of shit. Don't, you know, just don't worry about it. It's never going to happen. So he says to his lawyer, I, I, this guy is wrong. He, I was told that I needed to be back in a few days with this money. And uh, and I practice in front of this judge. My practice is in Brooklyn. I don't want, you know, he's looking, he's thinking about repercussions for himself yeah. if he doesn't go along with the corrupt judge. So the lawyer sets up, makes a call to the DA. The DA makes a call to me. And what we do is we now set up what is, in my opinion, a pretty good thing. We tell him to go to the bank. I'm sorry. We, we tell him that we're going to give him $18,000. And why 18? Because if you go and take 10,000 out of a bank, you got to fill they have to fill yeah. out a suspicious activity report. So we 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 were, we were wondering if the judge would be sharp enough if this guy came in with 20 grand and said I went to the bank, he was going to think that maybe there was a suspicious activity report. So we told him to tell the judge you went twice to the bank, took out 9 grand each time, and here's the 18,000. So he he agreed except that we had them wired. We had them wired. And the way that we did this is because with the recording device, we if, if we had to secrete it on him, let's say in his pocket or in his pants or someplace like that, we were afraid that if the judge whispered in his ear again, we wouldn't catch the, um, we wouldn't catch the, 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 the conversation. Mm -hmm. So my, my detective friend, who's the sharpest guy that I know, tells me, tells him, you have a, a jacket at home, suit jacket that you don't want anymore. He says, yeah, yeah, I got a blazer. He says, great, bring it in. So he brings it into the office. And what my, my buddy does is he opens up the seams in the collar and he puts the recording device into the jacket and runs two, wide, little, two little, very, very thin wired microphones into the collar of the, into each lapel on his jacket. <laughs> so he would have, be able to catch the, the um the the conversation we send the guy in and what we were also concerned about is if if the lawyer walked through the metal detectors in the courthouse with the wires on that it would oh, set yeah. off you know the, so my what my detective friend says is i'll wear the jacket i got a shield i'll meet you in the men's room on the other side of the metal detector and we do that gary we get everything we need he gives him the 18 grand we get everything and we were going to do a second payment, but my boss says, let's not push it. Let's, yeah. we got them. We got everything we need. And it's the weekend of the Martin Luther King holiday. So Monday is a day off. Tuesday morning, my boss says, I want you on the scene when we arrest the judge. So I get up. He's a tennis player, the judge. He gets up very early every morning and uh, to go play tennis. So we sit the detective picks me up we sit across the street from this guy's house <laughs> it's like three o'clock in the morning we're waiting for him to come out of the house three o'clock passes four o'clock passes five o'clock passes no judge we say oh man maybe this guy went away for the weekend didn't come back early enough because we had other detectives waiting to stop the car at a certain point finally it's about five o'clock 
in the morning and we see a light come on and he comes out and we said, oh, thank God. We were about to give it up, Gary. We were about mm. to go back to the office and say, we'll try another morning. We follow him. Our de- other detectives pulled him over. I get out of the car. We sit in front of, uh, of, of this kind of shopping mall where we stopped them. And, and the judge says, fellas, 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 it's okay. I'm good. Everything's good. I'm a, I'm a judge. And he holds out his, <laughs> his ID. ID. Yeah. And we say, we know. That's why we're arresting you. And I tell him, judge, you're on the arrest. Get in the car. So here's the car. We've got to drive back to the office. The, my detective, George, is driving. I'm in the back seat with the judge. He doesn't, I give him his rights. He doesn't say a word. And then I look over about five minutes into the drive, six minutes into the drive. He's sleeping, Gary. He's oh, sleeping in the back seat of the car. I say, George, this fucking guy is sleeping. George says, well, now we know that he did it because only the guilty sleep. And I remember this from when my days when I was riding homicide duty, I get to the precinct and I'd say to the detective, where's the bad guy? He said, he's in the room sleeping. He said, Mike, we got the right guy because only, the, only the, the guilty sleep, the bad. And think about it. If you're innocent, you're going to be protest, protesting you yeah. and you're, you're all wi- wired up. So, so that case starts us off the day that he's sentenced by the way the report it, and it was a big big daily news um, yeah, big man. news thing, uh, story the day he's sentenced they had cameras in the courtroom and there's a woman at home watching the sentencing and the next day she makes a call to our office and she gets a, an assistant da on the phone who was on duty that day for calls like this and she tells them that she has another judge who she believes is corrupt and is looking to get paid. And um, she comes in and she speaks to the ADA. He goes to a couple of the bosses who are under me, but not he didn't come to me right away. They said, well, you know, it's a judge. She's a crazy lady. She's upset. And the point was that he was the judge was supposed to decide on whether or not she was going to get custody of her kids. It was in domestic. It was in, in, in a uh, domestic court. And her husband, they had gotten a divorce. Her husband wanted custody. She was um, she was fighting the custody. And while she was sitting in court one day, some guy approached her and said, I know how I can get you to custody. I know this judge. I know a lawyer who knows the judge. You can come and pay me and I'll get it to the judge and you'll win custody. That was the case. <laughs> so, George, I go back to George and I tell him what happened. And he says, um, he says, Mike, let's do this. Now, Gary, this is a Russian woman from uh, a Jewish Russian woman with a very thick accent who's pregnant and she is afraid that she's going to lose her kids. And I say to George, so what should we do? He said, well, she's supposed to meet the judge. Uh, I'm sorry. She's supposed to meet the middleman tonight at his place of business. He, he owned an electronics store of some kind. He, was, he sold refurbished electronics. So George said, let's wire her up, send her in. I said, George, she's pregnant. We're going to send a, 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 a woman who's pregnant into this unknown location. He goes, we'll have our guys outside. She'll be wired. We'll be listening. If there's a problem, we'll, you know, we'll bust into the place. She had the guts, Gary. She had the guts to do it. She wanted to do it. And we got a terrific, terrific conversation with her, in, uh, with him and her involving this judge and a lawyer who, as it turns out, was assigned to be a guardian of her kids. So he was already involved in the case, but this lawyer was the corrupt lawyer who was essentially paying clerks off to get his cases in front of this corrupt judge Mm -hmm. who he was paying off. Mm -hmm. So, So the whole thing kind of came together. And what we were able to do after putting a wire on the on the lawyer's phone, on the the middleman's phone, we were able to get a, a a search warrant and a wiretap warrant for the judge's chambers. And we put a recording device as well as cameras in the judge's chambers. And we had a camera above his desk in a fortuitously, it wow. was kind of acoust- acoustic tiles. And one corner of one tile was broken. <laughs> and we were able to put the lens of the camera into that one place. And for the next Three months or so, we sat and watched this judge commit crime after crime after crime until we turned the lawyer. We got him one morning and we said to him, here's the deal. 
you're either going to jail or you're going to work for us. And, um, and he decided to work for us. And now we had an insider who was actually paying off the judge. And, um, and, and that case led us now to the head of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn because the judge was appointed by him to the, ju- the judicial position. And he said, I can give you the head of the Democratic Party in Brooklyn, who was the third member, the third ranking member of the assembly, the state assembly. <laughs> wow. I indicted him four <laughs> times, convicted him three out of four. And what he was doing was he was shaking down judicial candidates to use people who were his people to do printing and and things of that nature mm-hmm. for their campaigns. And he, and he also said, you're not going to get my endorsement, which was tantamount to election, yeah. unless you do this. Mm-hmm. So he gets convicted. And during the course of the investigation with the judge and with him, we, we the lawyer was wired, and he has a conversation <laughs> With this judge's con- with judge's cousin, who is also a judge, and he tells us that he has been, he's a guardian for his old elderly aunt and controlling her money, and he tells the lawyer that he's been stealing from his aunt. <laughs> so, so the corruption, Gary, was <laughs> enormous, enormous. Yeah. I tried all of these cases, wow. convicted everybody, and... Um, and it was, you know, it was something that, that by the time I was done, it was almost, I, I shouldn't say this, as it turns out, it was almost time for me to retire because the <laughs> DA at that point was running for re-election again and we all, we ultimately lost. Yeah. But that was the, those are the, the that was the center of, um, of Crooked Brooklyn. There's one more little piece. And that is, um, actually, let me tell you two more little pieces. One, one was also uh, an assembly woman who controlled in in New York, if 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 you were going to let's say, and in, in this case, it was a, a a contractor was looking to build a series of homes in in her district, and and he was looking for the okay, her okay, her imprimatur before the city would grant him the license to do this. And she said to him uh, on tape because he had come to us and we had wired him up because he knew that she was going to try to shake him down. And she said to him, "I'll give you the imprimatur essentially." But I want you to build me a home. I want you to put a fake mortgage on the home so that it looks like I'm buying it from you. But I don't want to have to pay one cent for this um, for this home. And he agreed. And of course, we arrest her. That's another part of this. All right, Michael Bencioni. So uh, name off your books. You've got several, and I don't have a list right here in front of me. Well, the one that the, the, the two most recent, the most recent is called Fallen Angel. That's my first novel, but it involves the cases that are in it and the tr- crimes that are in it are all cases that were mine. The one before that is Homicide is My Business, Luigi the Zip, um, a hitman's quest for honor. Before that was, um, was the Behind the Murder Curtain, Crooked Brooklyn before that. And Friends of the Family was the first. And I'm about, and I just finished Fallen Angel book two. And I'm about to start, that will be out in September. And I'll be, I'm just about to start Fallen Angel book three. I got a three book deal on Fallen Angel. Okay. Um, so there, there are that many cases that I did, Gary, that I can <laughs> fill three books with the, with, with the, with the crimes, you know. Wow. And, and let me just fill one other thing. And, and it's, and I have two short stories that are available on Amazon for 99 cents. Okay. One of them is called Murder on the Bridge. It's about a homicide involving a young woman that I that I did early on in my career and the other is is about is called Hand of the Killer. And um and and it uh it's a very interesting story because it turns the whole solving of the case turns on a baby's pacifier and a palm print left at the scene of this murder by the by the bad guy and and i i won't go into it anymore i would suggest you know i would really kind of urge your your viewers and readers if they would like to uh, listeners i'm sorry get them they're only 99 cents but i think that they'll enjoy the stories now of course the books are all available on amazon and wherever books are sold so and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to 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 
to, to for this little ad for my for my books. Really? Well, so. it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Michael. I, I really it, it's enjoyable as heck for me, especially being a cop and being all around in that and kind of hearing the Thank prosecution you. side and. <laughs> It's enjoyable for me as well. And um and and believe it or not, Gary, I got more stories. So if you ever have <laughs> okay. a, a show to fill, just give me a call and I'll be All happy right. to, to to come back on. All right. Michael Vecchioni, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Michael. Thank you, Gary. All right. Well, guys, that was great. Don't forget, you know, the set. I, I got a little link to it to the set. Be sure and give that podcast a shot. And if you got a problem with PTSD, you know, all you got to do is go to the website of the VA and they've got a hotline there. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our friend, former Gambino member, Anthony Ruggiano, is a drug and alcohol counselor and has a hotline down in Florida. So you could have a, a real mob guy be your drug counselor, your alcohol counselor, if you want to get in recovery. And I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there in your car. And I really appreciate you coming on the show, Michael. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me, Gary.